All right, hi everybody. Uh, so I'm continuing our lecture for this week, and uh, now we're going to be focusing on World War I. Uh, even though World War I was fought primarily in Europe, uh, it changes American society in some pretty profound ways. For one thing, it really builds on some of the major trends in U.S. foreign policy that we've seen since the 1890s, uh, and it really kind of firmly establishes the United States as a world power, uh, economically, politically, and militarily. The war also promotes a number of major social changes in the United States, uh, both in terms of gender and also in terms of race. Uh, American women, uh, for the really for the first time, begin to work uh, in war industries. They find new opportunities in jobs that had previously been held by men. Women also become involved in peace movements during the war, and the war certainly may have accelerated the push for women's suffrage that I talked about uh, last time with the Progressive Era. Uh, African Americans are also affected by the war. They begin to move away from the violence and the economic deprivation of the South into the North. They are seeking jobs that became available during wartime. African Americans also fight in World War I uh, in large numbers, and they expected that when they returned home that they would be treated with respect that was due to them. Uh, we also see that in order to fight the war, the United States government creates a whole host of new bureaucratic agencies and correspondingly expands the power of the federal government. The war, unfortunately, also results in a climate of repression and intolerance on the home front. Uh, in an effort to sell the American people on the war, the Wilson administration ends up conducting a propaganda campaign that really demonizes the enemy and it plays upon Americans' patriotism and, and nationalistic feelings. Uh, and helped along by this propaganda campaign, anti-German sentiment really spreads rapidly throughout the United States and it even results in some pretty brutal violence in some cases. The repression of dissent uh, was encouraged by the federal government during World War I, and it results in the uh, kind of harassment and persecution of a lot of people who were against the war. And as I mentioned last time, the war really represents the kind of culmination and also the kind of ending of the progressive era, as we're going to see. So the big questions that we have to consider when we're thinking about World War I is, first of all, why was World War I fought? Uh, and how did the results of the war sow the seeds for future conflict? Uh, and then how did the government promote freedom and democracy abroad while at the same time creating restrictions on both of these values at home? Uh, so those are the kind of things we're going to be talking about today. I'm first going to talk a little bit about how we get into the war. Uh, and to do that, we really have to understand something about who Woodrow Wilson was, who the president was, uh, you know, what kind of a person this guy was, uh, and why that kind of, you know, matters for getting us into World War I. So Wilson, as I mentioned last time, he was a progressive, uh, and he very much had his foreign policy driven by this vision, this very idealistic vision of a harmonious and prosperous international situation. He believed that the United States could influence and be a good example, uh, and that this could, he could bring about this vision, uh, could bring this vision to reality in a peaceful way. Wilson was an academic. Uh, he was a professor of political science, uh, and he was very much a firm believer in democratic principles. He said that democracy is the fullest form of state life uh, because it makes politics a sphere of moral action and strives toward the universal emancipation and brotherhood of man. So he's very pro-democracy. He is very much a progressive. He believes in domestic reform, and he sees that there's a connection to the kind of reforms that are going on in the in the United States uh, at the time with the Progressive Era and foreign policy. He said, the same exploitation and injustice within our borders applies to international questions. Just as soon as we are just to the people of the United States, justice and equity abroad will follow. 
And he believed that the United States, he very much believed the United States should be, as he said, the light which shall shine unto all generations and guide the soul, the feet of mankind to the ju goal of justice and liberty and peace. So he had this very idealistic vision of progressive, international, harmonious world. Uh, and he, he very much tries to carry that out uh, when he becomes president. Now, what is leading Europe and eventually the United States to war? Well, kind of the opposite of what Wilson was talking about, a kind of, you know, harmonious international situation where everything is peaceful and everybody gets along. What we see developing in the late 19th and early 20th century in Europe is, this, is these kind of really intense rivalries for empire among European nations. Uh, and this leads to this growing sense of nationalism. It leads to a, an arms race, a buildup of navy, naval, uh, you know, sort of arms and also, you know, sort of uh, armies. Uh, and there's a creation of a very complicated network of alliances in Europe. So we have the, we have what's known as the Triple Alliance, uh, Austria-Hungary, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, Germany, and uh, Italy uh, initially. Uh, they are known as the, uh, the, the central powers of the Triple Alliance. They become allies. Uh, and Britain, France, and Russia, they became known as the, uh, the Allied Powers or the Triple Entente. Uh, the Allies, so they're in green here, uh, and then we have the Central Powers, the Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and also the Ottoman Empire. And they are, so there's this web of alliances going on in Europe, um, and the balance of power in Europe really rests very precariously on it, all, a whole bunch of these kind of very obscure treaties uh, that are made, but they mask years of jealousy and distrust and kind of, you know, rivalry, basically, between these powers. Now, the chief rivalry was between Britain and Germany. These two nations had been competing for territory in Africa and Asia for years, and they were engaging this huge naval arms race, building up their, their navy. Now, interestingly, Italy, uh, as I mentioned, Italy was initially part of this alliance with Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, but they don't uh, remain with allied with the Central Powers when war actually breaks out. Even though it was allied with Germany and Austria-Hungary since 1882, it actually wanted parts of Austria, and it maintained a secret treaty, a secret understanding with France, which eventually, you know, effectively nullifies this alliance that they had with Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, so this is an example of the kind of secret treaties and alliances that Wilson, uh, as a progressive internationalist, was very much opposed to, and he would be very kind of opposed to that uh, in the aftermath of World War I. So what happens is that uh, the Austro-Hungarian government, they try to keep the Italians neutral, but the Italians end up going with France and Great Britain and Russia uh, after war breaks out. Uh, Italy declares war on Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and uh, they end up, you know, sort of joining this other part of the alliance here. So what sparks the war? Well, it's really this Anglo-German rivalry that is the underlying source of tensions that leads to World War I, but it's not the immediate cause of the outbreak. The conflict emerges out of a controversy involving nationalist movements within the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Now, the Austro-Hungarian Empire at this point is on very shaky ground. People who are living within what is now known as Bosnia Herzegovina, the capital uh, being Sarajevo, uh, they are very unhappy with Austro Hungarian rule. They want to be part of Serbia over here. And this nationalist group within, uh, within really located within Sarajevo, they uh, are known as the Black Hand, and they were plotting to assassinate various Austro-Hungarian leaders. So when the throne, when the heir to the th Austro-Hungarian throne, a guy named the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, 
he announces plans that he's going to visit Sarajevo in June of 1914. He becomes the next target of this rebel uh, nationalist group. So on June 28, 1914, Archduke Ferdinand is assassinated by a member of this group known as the Black Hand, a guy named Gavrilo Princip, uh, while, he, while the, the Duke is driving through the streets of Sarajevo, um, and he is killed by this, uh, this you know, kind of extreme nationalist. Now, this seems like a very local controversy, right? It's this tiny little country that wants to be uh, wants to split away from the Austro-Hungarian Empire and join Serbia. This quickly escalates, though, into a through the fact that you had this kind of whole web of alliances of European powers. So, Austro-Hungary is obviously not very happy with this idea. They say we're going to attack Serbia in retaliation for this assassination. Germany then comes to Serbia's defense, or Germany supports uh, Austria-Hungary's Austria decision to attack Serbia. Um, they say, you know, we'll, we'll back you up here. Uh, the Serbians call upon the Russians to defend them uh, because, you know, Serbia is a tiny little country. So they're like, you know, hey, Russia over there, you know, you're a, you're a big country. You can come and help us. The Russians begin mobilizing their army at the end of July. By August 3rd, Germany had declared war on both Russia and France, uh, and because Russia was allied with France. And so they end up actually, the Germans end up invading Belgium to prepare for an invasion of France. On August 4th, Great Britain, to honor its alliance with France and to halt the advance of its rival, Germany, the British declare war on Germany. Russia and the Austro-Hungarian Empire begin fighting a couple of days later. Within a series of weeks to months, other smaller nations like Italy and the Ottoman Empire, they join the fight. So by early 1915, almost the entire European continent and part of Asia is at war. Now, America had not been involved in any of the controversies that began the war. We were mostly concerned with, you know, what was going on in the Caribbean and the Pacific. We're not, you know, terribly interested in what's going on with Germany or with Germany and Britain, and France and all that stuff that's happening in Europe. Uh, and so Wilson, he says, OK, we are going to maintain official neutrality. He calls upon his fellow citizens to be neutral in fact as well as in name, impartial in thought as well as in action. And he argued that the U.S. has to remain neutral in order to kind of be this kind of disinterested, objective partner and leader of the world. Now, this is going to be difficult to achieve in practice because the majority of Americans, including Wilson, are kind of sympathetic to Britain. They are, you know, not really on the side of the Germans. Uh, the bond, of course, you know, sort of there's this bond between the United States and Britain. They're kind of English-speaking peoples. They have this common civilizing mission. Our connections with France were not necessarily as close at the time, but we have kind of sentimental ties to France. France had supported us in the American Revolution. They had given the U.S. the Statue of Liberty, and we start to hear all of these reports of German atrocities being committed in Belgium and France. These reports were largely, or at least in partly, exaggerated by the British, uh, but this kind of ends up strengthening America's hostility toward Germany. Now, uh, Amer not all Americans are on the side of the British and the French. Uh, there were very large immigrant communities in the United States, and they are reacting to the war based on their old, you know, homeland ties. German Americans, of course, retain a lot of affection for Germany. Irish Americans are very anti-British. So they are not, you know, there, there is a certain amount of opposition uh, to kind of the Allied side. Now, in personal feelings, as I mentioned, Wilson was not neutral at all. He was firmly anti-German and pro-British. But he says, no, we're going to be neutral. The U.S. has to be neutral because America, the American people are against going to war. We need to maintain domestic unity. America is supposed to be this kind of model and leader for the world. We don't want to get involved in any kind of conflict. So that's the kind of official line that, that Wilson takes. <clears throat> 
Now, neutrality doesn't mean that the U.S. is going to disengage from the world. Americans are very eager to continue their commercial activities abroad. And so Americans are still carrying goods to Europe. We are still traveling on European ships. We are engaged in financial transactions with European governments. Now, international law allows neutral nations to engage in trade with powers that are at war. But it also allows those warring powers to do things like intercept ships, confiscate cargo, take away personnel, uh, even detain ships that were bound for the enemy. And so these warring powers try to restrict the rights of neutral powers so that they're not going to benefit the side of the enemy. So what ends up happening is that Britain institutes a naval blockade and, you know, puts a whole bunch of mines in the North Sea. And Britain begins seizing American ships, even those that were carrying goods to neutral nations. The Germans counter this with a, the use of U-boats or submarines. They start using submarine warfare against uh, you know, both British and neutral ships. Uh, and, of course, the chief advantage of the submarine is surprise. Now, international law at the time said, no, 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 any kind of warship that's attacking has to warn passenger and merchant ships before attacking so that they could, you know, kind of, uh, you know, make sure to, you know, minimize civilian casualties. But, of course, submarines don't do this. The chief advantage of the submarine is surprise. Uh, and so... This starts to become a real problem. So the Germans begin attacking uh, American ships, and on May 7th, 1915, a German submarine, a U-boat, sinks a British ocean liner, uh, the Lusitania, which is sailing off the coast of Ireland. This uh, ocean liner was not armed. It was a passenger ship, but it was actually carrying war supplies, uh, including a number of uh, arms. And it ends up sinking in about 18 minutes. Nearly 1,200 people, uh, including 128 Americans, drowned in the sinking of the Lusitania. And this is a tragedy that horrifies the Americans. Uh, you know, even though the Germans had said, hey, you know, don't be traveling in the war zones, that's, you know, sort of not good. Uh, American newspapers, they call this mass murder. They call for the declaration of war. Wilson ends up sending a series of protest notes demanding reparation for the loss of American lives and demanding that Germany pledge not to attack these ocean liners without warning. His Secretary of State, William Jennings Bryan, uh, he actually resigns in protest. He says, no, you know, you, now you're starting to get uh, Wilson. He, Bryan is even more kind of militantly, you know, internationalist than Wilson is. And he says, Wilson, you are, you know, you're not even, you're, you're starting to move away from this idea of neutrality. Now you're trying to, you know, sort of dictate what the, what the Germans can do. This is, you know, sort of not, this is against my, you know, kind of values. So the Lusitania crisis causes a whole outpouring of support for America beginning to prepare to get involved in the war. Uh, and the fact that Wilson kind of is launching this official protest against German policies reduces the possibility that we are going to be kind of going to remain kind of a neutral power. Now the poster on the le on the right here is one of the rarest and most famous propaganda posters of World War One. It's meant to invoke the memory of the Lusitania to encourage people to enlist in the war. Now in 1916. Uh, we are facing a presidential election. And Wilson's chances of re-election at this point seem to be kind of slim. Of course, he had only won in 1912 because Roosevelt and the Progressive Party had split the Republican vote. Now, in 1916, Roosevelt was again seeking the Republican nomination. So Wilson is facing a very difficult battle for re-election. And he cannot ignore that there are very powerful forces opposing America getting involved in the war. 
Wilson, the question of whether the U.S. should not necessarily get involved, but at least start to prepare to get involved for, in the war, this is kind of a, a big issue in the campaign. And Wilson at first decides with the anti-preparedness forces. He argues that, well, if we start building up our military, that's needlessly provocative. But tensions are starting to build between the U.S. and Germany, and so he ends up changing his mind. And he endorses a proposal uh, in 1915 for enlarging and reorganizing the army. Uh, the bill meets with a huge amount of opposition, uh, but eventually it ends up passing. Now, this peace faction, these people who want to, you know, sort of keep the U.S. out of the war, basically at all costs, uh, they still wield a lot of strength within Wilson's party. And this is very evident at the Democratic National Convention in the summer of 1916. The keynote speaker at that convention led the delegates in a chant, what did we do? We didn't go to war. Uh, and this speech helps to produce Wilson's re-election campaign slogan, he kept us out of war. That's his kind of big selling point uh, in the 1916 presidential race. The Republicans nominate a guy named Charles Evans Hughes. He's the former governor of New York, and his uh, platform also calls for neutrality. Uh, and also, he calls for neutrality, but also preparedness. Uh, and uh, so the election becomes very, very close. Uh, Wilson actually went to bed that night of the election thinking that he had lost. He wins re-election by fewer than 600,000 popular votes and only by 23 electoral votes. It wasn't actually decided until the Democrats carried California. Um, and so they end up retaining control over Congress, but it's a very close election. And Wilson is kind of feeling really boxed in now. He's argued that he should be reelected because he's going to keep the U.S. out of the war. Now he really feels like he has to kind of, you know, uh, maintain that promise. But events start to overtake uh, the, the, you know, sort of efforts to keep the U.S. out of the war. The Germans take kind of a last dramatic gamble to secure victory by launching attacks on the Western Front in early, uh, late 1916 and early 1917. So the military leaders in Germany, they launch a series of major assaults on the Allied lines in France. Germans say, you know, they feel that this kind of, you know, submarine warfare is really essential to their victory, and they don't want any restrictions placed on that submarine warfare. And they really want to make sure that the war is over before the U.S. gets involved. So they announce that they're going to begin unrestricted submarine warfare to cut Britain off from supplies. And the U.S. responds to this by cutting diplomatic ties with Germany. So the tensions are escalating. And then it becomes known that the Germans had secretly been corresponding with the government of Mexico uh, to the British interceptist telegram that is sent from the German foreign minister to the government of Mexico. And as you can see here, it says, We intend to begin on the 1st of February unrestricted submarine warfare. We shall endeavor, in spite of this, to keep the United States of America neutral. In the event of this not succeeding, in the event that the U.S. does come into the war, we make Mexico a proposal of alliance on the following basis. Make war together, make peace together, generous financial support, and an understanding on our part that Mexico is to reconquer the lost territory in Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. So the Germans are basically offering Mexicans these lost provinces of Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas as bait for entering the war with the U.S. on their side. And so this is, this is very shocking. So they are proposing essentially that the Mexicans join with Germany against the U.S. Uh, and when this plot is made public, the reaction to this is just explosive uh, it's just, you know, it shatters any kind of remaining confidence that Wilson had in Germany's good wishes. Uh, it builds up huge amount of popular sentiment for war. People are just, you know, basically up in arms over this. In mid-March, Germany, Germany resumes unrestricted submarine warfare. And then by the end of the month, uh, Wilson is, Wilson's cabinet is recommending that we actually get involved in the war.
Now, of course, Wilson, he did not want to abandon these cherished ideals and morals by going to war. And the majority of the American people before the events of March, uh, February and March of 1917 also held these Wilsonian ideals. Most people wanted to stay neutral. Um, and there are all kinds of anti-war rallies staged uh, in major cities across the country. It's really kind of two immediate factors that propel the U.S. into war. It's Germany's assault on American lives and property with their unrestricted submarine warfare, and it's the Zimmer Zimmerman telegram. This causes Wilson to lose all faith in the good intentions of the German government. Uh, and so, uh, in his message to Congress that Wilson sends, asking for a declaration of war, he says that Germany has, you know, has embarked on a warfare against humanity. He says that war had been thrust upon the United States. Now, the British, of course, wanted the U.S. to enter the war, not only to help in the fighting, but also to help in the peacemaking. And scholars have argued that the U.S. never was really neutral. And so war against Germany was basically a kind of a foregone conclusion. Our economic and cultural ties with Britain and France were much stronger than with Germany, uh, even though there's this very large German immigrant population in the U.S. And people have even argued that Wilson himself really wanted to get involved in the war secretly um, because he believed that as a head of a nation who was participating in the war, that he would be guaranteed a seat at the peace table. He would be able to influence the outcome of the war. He would be able to project those progressive ideals onto whatever peace settlement uh, would be reached. But if he were the head of a neutral nation, he, uh, as he said, could only call through a crack in the door, that he wouldn't have that same kind of influence, that he wouldn't be able to exert that same kind of influence over the peace. Um, and some people have suggested that Wilson's idealism, his vision of himself as kind of a leader of America, the model for the rest of the world, were these factors leading him towards per participation in the war. So famously, of course, Wilson says in his war message, he says, the world must be made safe for democracy. Its peace must be planted upon the tested foundations of political liberty. We are but one of the champions of the rights of mankind. We shall be satisfied when those rights have been made as secure as the faith and the freedom of nations can make them. So making the world safe for democracy. Wilson is arguing that the peace cannot be achieved except through this partnership of democratic nations. We can't trust the German autocratic rulers. So he's implicitly calling here for the overthrow of the German government and for the establishment of a democratic state. Wilson is initially very heartened by world events at the time. In March of 1917, uh, Events in Russia, the revolution there topples the czarist regime. It's replaced initially with this new republican form of government. So the U.S. doesn't have to ally itself with kind of this despotic monarchy of the czar. So he's very much kind of heartened by this, at least initially. Wilson's speech mostly unites even most reluctant Americans behind U.S. entry into the war, and he's hailed as a great statesman by the press. But there is still quite a bit of opposition to, to going to war in Congress. Fifty representatives and six senators vote against the declaration of war. So in the spring of 1917, Britain is really suffering from vast losses from attacks by German submarines. One out of every four ships sailing from British ports never ends up returning. And the American entrance into the war very quickly re-alters that, uh, alters that balance. The Americans come in with their destroyer fleet. They help the British Navy. Uh, they escort other merchant vessels across the Atlantic. Uh, the sinkings of Allied ships go down dramatically uh, by the fall of 1918. Many Americans were really hopeful that maybe just getting our Navy involved would be enough to turn the tide, but it quickly becomes clear that we're going to have to commit ground troops to shore up the Allies. Britain and France, you know, had lost thousands of soldiers. Uh, it was a very deadly war. Um, but the U.S. didn't have a large enough standing army to provide those necessary ground forces. So Wilson ends up passing a national draft, even though this is very unpopular. There are all kinds of protests against the draft going on. And he brings three million men into the army, and another two million end up joining the armed services voluntarily. Now, the engagement of American troops in the war was brief, but it was very intense. 
Uh, significant numbers of American troops were not really ready for battle until the spring of 1918, and by eight months later, the war was over. So what was it like for these U.S. troops fighting in the war? Despite the fact that they only fought for a short period of time, the experience of the troops in the war was very intense, and this was in part due to new technologies of warfare that were first introduced on a massive scale in World War, II, World war I. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these new technologies. This picture here is a picture of German troops in a trench using machine guns. And trench warfare really quickly became necessary in World War I because of the enormous destructive power of these newly improved machine guns and this higher powered artillery. It was no longer feasible to just send troops out into an open field or even to allow them to camp in the open. They would just be instantly slaughtered. The first day of the Somme offensive really illustrates this. The British suffered a record number of single day casualties. 60,000 men were killed uh, under this kind of just relentless machine gun fire. And so both sides pretty quickly resort to trench warfare. These trenches were dug, they sheltered the troops, they allowed for a very limited and usually pretty inconclusive fighting. Troops, both sides, they would literally fight for weeks to take only a few inches of ground back from the enemy. So that's one reason that warfare in World War I becomes so destructive and deadly is because it becomes kind of bogged down in this trench warfare. Now this picture here is a picture of a uh, captured British tank, a German, uh, it's a German photograph uh, showing a captured British tank. Uh, fight, these fighting conditions on the Western Front, this trench warfare, prompts the British Army to begin researching the creation of an armored vehicle that could cross these trenches that could crush the barbed wire that could withstand those machine guns. And so tanks and other mobile weapons like flamethrowers makes trench warfare obsolete because these new weapons are now capable of piercing these entrenched positions. So again, this creates, you know, sort of an enormous amount of destruction and, and, and death. This picture down here is a picture of British troops wearing gas masks, and they are loading a poison gas canister, readying it for launch. Now, poison gas, chemical warfare, had been considered uncivilized before the war. It had actually been outlawed at a Hague conference in 1899. And it was first brought in to the war to help try to break this stalemate of the trench warfare. The German army was the first to really commit serious research to developing new chemical weapons, and they were the first to use them on a large scale. Uh, the first use of poison gas, chlorine gas, came at the Second Battle of Ypres on April 22, 1915. And the effects of this chlorine gas were really severe. Uh, basically, within seconds of inhaling the gas, uh, your respiratory organs, your lungs, everything were just destroyed. Uh, you were basically choking to death. Uh, the Germans' use of chlorine gas provokes immediate widespread condemnation. And it you know, doesn't do much to help uh, German relations with the United States. We see this as being just you know, completely beyond the pale. Now, once the Allies had recovered from the shock of the fact that the Germans had used gas, uh, they soon began developing chemical weapons of their own. The British were the first to respond, and they began using gas, and it just begins escalating from there. The Germans introduced mustard gas in September of 1917, and that is even worse than the chlorine gas because it causes both internal and external injuries. It's harder pr to protect against because it doesn't just affect your respiratory system, it also affects your skin. It's just really horrible. Uh, and so this becomes, you know, sort of one of the things that really comes out of uh, World War I as being one of the most destructive elements of it. Finally, this picture here is a picture of an American aviator posing with his plane. Uh, World War I was the first conflict where airplanes play a significant role. Now, of course, these planes were relatively simple at the time. They were not very maneuverable. Uh, Anti-aircraft technology was not very highly developed yet either, so they were pretty effective, actually. Uh, and they were used as bombers. They were used as fighters. They were used for reconnaissance, uh, all kinds of different things. And they were, you know, one of the technologies that really comes out of World War One.
Now, these new technologies were largely responsible for the appalling casualties in the First World War. And this chart shows the level of destruction and death caused by the war. One million men from the British Empire, which includes Britain and Canada and Australia and India and other places as well, uh, end up dying in the war. France lost 1.7 million. Germany lost 2 million. The Austro-Hungarian Empire lost 1.5 million. Italy, about 460,000. Russia, about 1.7 million. Turkey never counted casualties, but it must have been, you know, pretty, pretty large. Uh, in Britain, one-third of the men born between 1892 and 1895 ended up dying in World War I. So this was just an entire generation of young men wiped out. Uh, the U.S. enters the war near the end. Uh, we were only engaged in some of the more success last successful offenses, and so we suffered very light casualties in contrast. Uh, 112,000 uh, men died in World War uh, One, and half of those were actually died from influenza, the influenza epidemic that breaks out towards the end of the war. But American casualties were very high in the battles in which U.S. troops were centrally involved. One of the reasons that World War I is going to be so reviled in the 1920s and 1930s is that there's this huge number of deaths, and not to mention the wounded and those people who were scarred physically and emotionally. This afflicts all of Europe. It's an entire generation of men dead, and it's just appalling to people. So that kind of gives you a sense of why the war happened and what was kind of the result of it, how it was fought. Uh, now I'm going to turn to talking a little bit about the effect of the war on the U.S. home front. Now, the U.S. government and government leaders in the war were, were painfully aware that public sentiment about American involvement in the war had been divided. And even after war was declared, there were a lot of people who were still opposed to it. Uh, Wilson had been lecturing the nation for three years on its duty to maintain neutrality. So he really felt like that he would have to take extraordinary measures to carry the people with him once he actually ends up declaring war on Germany. Uh, he might have overestimated the amount of opposition to the war, but he certainly was right to worry about it. Uh, Irish Americans, German Americans, as we talked about, they were, of course, opposed to a war uh, with, the, with the United States, with England, against Germany and Austria. Uh, those on the left, socialists, uh, they opposed the war because they considered it a, to be a war for capitalism. Uh, and socialist ideals were more in vogue in 1917 than they maybe are today, although it does seem to be making a comeback. Uh, reformers of all kinds, progressives, populists, feminists, they opposed the war because they considered war to be inherently reactionary. They considered it to be a, a, an uncivilized way of mediating conflict. And Wilson even doubted that, you know, the average citizen would still be supportive if, you know, sort of they were to learn what the actual war effort would require. And above all, he worried that he, he had to draft this army, and he worried that this would set off the kind of riots that the nation saw during the Civil War. Uh, and most Americans, if they, you know, they hadn't really considered that, you know, the president might call for a draft. Might, they thought, well, maybe he'll just call for volunteers. But Wilson, of course, he's a progressive. He has this progressive obsession with efficiency. He prefers this system of raising troops rather than kind of just relying upon volunteerism. Uh, and so in order to make his draft uh, palatable, uh, Wilson, you know, so many in Wilson's administration, they believe that it's really crucial to unite public opinion behind the war effort. And so in order to help unite the public behind the war effort and to help, you know, make this, sell this idea of the draft to the American public, he creates a, an organization called the Committee on Public Information. Uh, and so Wilson makes this agency uh you know, the draft agency, uh, he makes it staffed by civilians. Uh, they appoint these local draft boards throughout the country. And it's staffed by, you know, sort of the local people. Uh, and they set up offices, you know, sort of all around the country that you can register for the draft in. Uh, and Wilson really believes he has to try to sell the war. 
Uh, and so he creates this Committee on Public Information, or the so-called Creel Committee, uh, because it was under the direction of a guy named George Creel. Uh, and they orchestrate this vast propaganda campaign. Uh, and so the, you know, they create all these kind of famous posters, including, for example, the famous poster of Uncle Sam pointing his index finger and saying, I want you. This comes from World War I and the Creel Committee. And so they, they distributed, you know, just millions of pieces of printed material, ads, uh, you know, posters, pamphlets, uh, and so you can see some of these uh, posters here. Uh, they also encouraged journalists to practice what they called self-censorship when reporting the war news. Uh, and most journalists who were kind of afraid of, you know, the government taking more co coercive measures against them, they complied by covering the war as the government w wanted them to. Um, and you can see that some of these posters really, you know, offer kind of, you know, very exaggerated, stereotypical pictures of kind of German savagery and the enemy. So you can see on the top two posters, this really shows the kind of demonization of the Germans as the enemy. Uh, they're depicted as these kind of dark, menacing figures uh, looming over, you know, this Europe who's, that's destroyed. Uh, this bottom picture down here, uh, this is one of the posters urging Americans to save food. And this one is particularly interesting because it's appealing to the immigrant population. Uh, it says, you came here seeking freedom, you must now help to preserve it. Uh, this picture down here is kind of interesting, which you, you may or may not be able to see too much because I might be blocking it a bit, but uh, it shows... Uh, an American laborer here in the middle uh, marching alongside a sailor and a soldier. And it says, together we win. Uh, and this is promoting the idea of workers continuing to work in American factories. It's discouraging strikes and unionism. So these advertisements are really imploring American citizens to also, to not only just support the war, but also to uh, report to the authorities any evidence among their neighbors of disloyalty or pacifism or you know anti-war sentiment and so the government also begins these real sort of strong efforts to try to promote americanism and suppress dissent uh, and they pass what become known as the espionage and sedition acts the espionage act of 1917 gives the government all these new tools to combat spying and sabotage and obstruction of the war effort. And the 1918 Sedition Act made it actually illegal to publicly express opposition to the war. So in practice, it allows officials to prosecute anyone who ends up even criticizing the president or the government. Uh, and the need to sell the war really explains how Wilson, you know, was really kind of articulating the nation's war aims in such an idealistic way, calling it a war to end all wars, a war to make this world safe for democracy. He's trying to sell the war to the public. Uh, and it also explains the, the idea of uh, these espionage and sedition acts. You know, these are aimed more at suppressing dissent uh, than preventing sabotage. Wilson really feels like he has to stop those who would actively oppose the war from infecting the rest of the American public. Now, the most frequent targets of uh, these acts were uh, anti-capitalist groups like the Socialist Party, uh, labor unions. Uh, American socialists were very much still opposed to the war. Uh, and many people had been kind of anti-socialist and favored, you know, sort of putting down uh, these socialists and radicals before the war. And so these wartime policies make it possible to kind of move against them. Uh, so during the war, Eugene V. Debs, who's the leader of the Socialist Party, uh, he's actually sentenced to 10 years in prison uh, in 1918. Ultimately, he becomes pardoned in 1921. Uh, more than... a. a 11,000 people are arrested in 1918 for the crime of criticizing the government or the war. Uh, and there's this kind of sentiment of virulent patriotism that sort of grips the country uh, during the war. State and local governments, uh, corporations, universities, even private citizens really spread this kind of virulent patriotism. 
And you even see kind of vigilante mobs uh, going after anybody who challenges the war. The greatest target for this kind of mob violence and abuse was the German-American community. Uh, for example, a mob in East St. Louis uh, in 1918 East St. Louis had a large German population, uh, seizes this young German immigrant uh, in 1918. They strip him. They dressed him in an American flag. They marched him through the streets, and then they ended up lynching him. Uh, and the eventual trial of those who committed this act led to their acquittal on the grounds that this lynching was a, quote, patriotic murder. Uh, and there was this campaign during the war to purge American society of anything that could, you know, smacked of anything related to Germany. Uh, performances of German music were banned. German books were removed from the shelves of libraries. Uh, courses in the German language were dropped. Uh, Germans were fired from their jobs. German foods were given new American names. The Frankfurter became the hot dog. The sauerkraut became Liberty Cabbage. Uh, and many American family, many German American families end up actually changing their surnames during the war to try to avoid being labeled as, as German. So there's all these efforts to kind of suppress dissent on the home front. And these lead to some pretty anti-democratic, uh, you know, kind of things for a war that was supposed to make the world safe for democracy. Now, African Americans uh, in the war, uh, had, you know, sort of their own new kind of unique experiences. 200,000 African Americans served in World War I, uh, including 42,000 combat troops. Uh, they were among the first to be sent into action in France. Despite their contributions to the war effort, no black soldiers were allowed to march in the victory celebrations in Paris uh, on the American side. They were not included in a mural of different races that were fought in the war, even though black servicemen from English and French colonies were represented. Those who did not go to war found their lives changing, you know, pretty drastically at home. African Americans in the South, uh, they heard that there were all these jobs for, you know, immense opportunities for jobs in the North in these war industries. And of course, they wanted to get away from the kind of violence and repression that they were facing in the South. And so we start to see African Americans moving out of the South and moving to the North uh, in huge numbers. Between 1916 and 1918, more than 450,000 African Americans leave the South for cities like St. Louis and Chicago and Cleveland and New York and Philadelphia. Most of these newcomers are young. Uh, most were unmarried. Uh, they were either skilled or semi-skilled workers. Uh, men found jobs in factories, uh, in steel mills, mines. Uh, women worked in textile factories, department stores, and restaurants. Now, of course, these African Americans moving to the North, they found greater racial freedom, but also, the, you know, they encountered racism in the North as well. Uh, racial tensions very much increased in the U.S. during the war, uh, in part because of this growing competition for housing and jobs. And so we see a series of race riots break out in the North uh, between 1917 and 1919. And these are cases of white Americans attacking black Americans. Even servicemen uh, returning home still in their uniform forms became targets for attack. Now, the war kind of spurs a lot of African Americans to, you know, fight back. Uh, they're more inclined to kind of, you know, protest and, and make their voices heard. This experience of serving in this war that was supposed to be spreading America's democratic values made them very acutely aware of their own lack of equality at home. And so they come back from their service in the war expecting better treatment. So there's this new militant spirit that arises out of the war. And there's, you know, kind of a sense of African Americans encouraging others to celebrate their heritage and celebrate their race. This picture here on the bottom is actually a very famous incident, a silent protest parade in New York. Uh, 10,000 African Americans marching through the streets silently, carrying signs saying, Mr. President, why not make America safe for democracy? Uh, and we also see, you know, sort of uh, the... Uh, the 
another kind of example of uh, kind of militant uh, African American uh, movements springing up after the war. Uh, support for the Universal Negro Improvement Association. This was a movement for uh, African independence and black self-reliance that was led by a guy named Marcus Garvey. Uh, he was an immigrant from Jamaica. And he uh, had this massive following for a time. And so this kind of gives you a sense of the kind of the, the new militancy in black communities that emerges out of uh, World War I. The lives of many American women were also transformed by the war. Uh, women went to work uh, in war industries uh, on a large scale, really for the first time. Uh, the war didn't really result in a huge upswing of women working, um, but uh, women did have new opportunities, and in some cases higher pay. Uh, and just as we'll see with World War II, after the war, women ended up, you know, sort of going back into the home. But uh, we do see, you know, kind of this, this new, these new opportunities opening up for women. Uh, women also served in the armed forces during the war. Uh, they established the Army and Navy Nurse Corps. Uh, and uh, nearly about 13,000 women enlisted in the Navy and in the Marine Corps during the war. About 30,000 women served in the Army and Navy Nurse Corps, uh, the Marines, the Coast Guard. Uh, and these women were serving their country before they actually had the right to vote. They were on the home front. The women on the home front were fighting for suffrage as the war is going on. And they encounter some criticism for doing so. Uh, but they're determined to hold President Wilson accountable to his democratic ideals. And you can see that in this picture. Uh, the sign reads, President Wilson is deceiving the world when he appears as the prophet of democracy. President Wilson has opposed those who demand democracy for this country. He is responsible for the disenfranchisement of millions of Americans. We in America know this. The world will find him out. So they're really calling Wilson out on, you know, his lack of support for women's suffrage, uh, you know, it being very hypocritical considering that he's trying to make the world safe for democracy. So the service of women in the military and in defense industries really gives a huge push to the passing of the 19th Amendment. Uh, President Wilson is kind of won over to the suffragist side in part because of the bravery of women who are serving on the front, the front and, uh, you know, kind of proving their abilities uh, at home. Women also worked to secure the peace, both during and after the war. Uh, the progressive activist Jane Addams was very active in this regard. She helped to establish an organization called the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom uh, in 1919. Uh, and... These women were basically, they were very influential uh, kind of as, as informal advisors to President Wilson. Uh, they actually, you know, sort of, uh, you know, helped him to kind of, you know, uh, influence uh, what was the outcome of the war in terms of, uh, you know, trying to make, uh, you know, sort of bring those progressive ideals uh, to, to the peace settlement. And in 1931, Jane Addams would eventually receive the, the Nobel Peace Prize for her efforts. So now we're kind of going to turn our attention a little bit back to the war and specifically to the end of the war and the struggle to craft a lasting peace. So Wilson, he had kind of turned America's participation into the war into this sort of quasi-religious crusade to change the nature of international relations. He had this vision of this new post-war order, uh, and this becomes known as Wilsonian internationalism. And he kind of articulates that vision in this famous document known as the 14 Points, uh, which he presents to Congress in January of 1918. He presents three kind of broad categories of war aims to Congress. Uh, so he includes a number of specific recommendations for adjusting post-war boundaries, for establishing new nations to replace the now you know, defunct Austro-Hungarian and Ottoman empires. And so... This was designed to kind of reflect Wilson's sort of overall belief in this idea of the right of people to self-determine, uh, the right of nation, pe you know, different people to kind of determine their own destiny and not to have, you know, sort of their, um, 
He sought to redefine these post-war boundaries uh, as much as possible uh, in accordance with the idea of nationality. Uh, so Wilson, of course, he's very much idealistic, believer in democracy, uh, and he says, you know, people should have the freedom to determine their own destiny, their own fate. And so this idea that each nationality should have its own nation. Now, of course, it's a lot easier to state those kinds of principles than to actually implement them. It's rare for a nation, you know, a nationality group to only live in one area or for a region to only consist of one, you know, kind of ethnic or national group. So there were these kind of recommendations for adjusting these post-war boundaries. Uh, there were some general principles that were supposed to govern future international conduct. Uh, things like freedom of the seas, open covenants rather than secret treaties, reducing armaments, free trade, uh, you know, impartial mediation of colonial claims, uh, various things to say, you know, okay, this is how the world is going to kind of govern itself after the war. And then he makes a proposal for what he calls a League of Nations, a general association of nations to help implement these new principles, to make these territorial adjustments, to help resolve future conflicts. Now, there are some serious flaws in Wilson's proposals. He has no real actual defined formula for deciding how are we going to implement this idea of national self-determination. Uh, and he hadn't really realized the full implications of this, um, but his vision kind of captivates people in Europe and America at the time, uh, and it reflects this idea that the world is capable of creating kind of this just, efficient government, that, that true international peace could be possible. Now, just as the U.S. enters the war, uh, Russia, as I mentioned, is seized by this kind of revolutionary upheaval. And so in March of 1917, there's a revolution in Russia. The Tsar is overthrown. Initially, there's a republic established, which Wilson was very, you know, sort of happy about initially. But uh, by November of that year, uh, the radical Bolsheviks have taken over uh, the government. And they kind of launched this ideological offensive to challenge these ideals of Wilsonian internationalism. Uh, and so... Their idea was that, you know, sort of, they, they were very much anti-imperialist. They were anti, you know, sort of having imperial powers. And Wilson is very much aware of this. And so the 14 points are specifically, you know, kind of at least in part in response to the Bolsheviks coming in and taking over Russia. So initially, Americans are very enthusiastic about the Russian Revolution. They say, you know, this is being, you know, kind of uh, this overthrow of this feudal aristocracy. This is great. It's within the spirit of the American Revolution. We are, you know, sort of all supportive of it. But the Republic is, the, the uh, you know, sort of leaders of this Republic are unable to maintain control, and the Bolsheviks come in and they take over. Uh, the new Bolshevik government imme immediately issues a peace decree. Uh, he calls for immediate opening of negotiations for a just and democratic peace. So Lenin, Vladimir Lenin, is a Marxist. Uh, he is trying to extend Marx's ideas about capitalism and the proletariat. He believes that capitalism and imperialism go hand in hand. Uh, and he, so the Russian Revolution at least the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, really poses a threat to Wilson's view of the world, his plan to kind of bring the U.S. into the war to make the world safe for democracy. This is not a democracy. This is a socialistic government. So in March of 1918, the Russians withdraw from the war. They make a separate peace with Germany, uh, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Uh, the B Bolshevik leaders decide their priority is to get out of the war. They are willing to accept even, you know, kind of the most humiliating terms. Uh, they lose a number of, you know, territory. And this really is a boon to the Germans because it allows them to concentrate on the Western Front. So the Allies are very much concerned that the Bolsheviks might join Germany against them. Uh, and they are, you know, basically flaunting Wilson's leadership here. They're saying, you know, sort of, nope, we're not going to listen to you. We're, we're going to join, we're going to leave the war and we're not going to fight on your side anymore. Uh, and so in the spring and summer of 1918, Wilson sends in 15,000 American troops into the Soviet Union 
joining other Allied soldiers. And the troops are supposed to be there to protect Allied supplies from the Germans and to rescue some uh, people from Czechoslovakia who wanted to return home. The underlying reason, though, is that Wilson and a number of other Allied leaders are really hopeful that maybe they can overthrow the Bolshevik government. Uh, and they're, you know, pretty much afraid that the Bolsheviks are going to kind of spread, you know, communism and revolution. And the U.S. joins in an economic blockade of Russia. We send weapons to anti-Bolshevik insurgents. We refuse to recognize Lenin's government. Uh, we block the Russians from participating in the peace conference. And so this is really where we start to see uh, the relations between the Russians and the Americans start to go south. It starts in World War I, and it's just going to kind of continue from there. So Wilson, uh, he is now, you know, the war has the war has concluded. Now he's set to, you know, sort of go to Paris for the peace talks. Uh, so he and his, you know, a whole entourage of advisors and technical experts, they go off to Paris uh, in December of 19, uh, 1918. And he is very confident that he will be able to persuade and get his way by appealing to the European people. And so he takes this kind of triumphant tour through Europe uh, before the conference. And he's greeted in Europe as a savior. He's almost worshipped by the ordinary people. When he enters Paris on December 13th, 1918, he is greeted, some people claim, by the largest crowd in the history of France. And you can see that he is, you know, sort of greeted as kind of, you know, the lauded hero of of the of the war so he comes in he's arrived in europe he arrives in europe to the great acclaim by the ordinary people uh, but he has a lot more difficulty convincing the leaders at this peace conference of his ideals he is really facing kind of the reality of european power politics here and the kind of conflicting personalities that he's dealing with here the british prime minister the prime minister of italy uh the prime minister of france the president of France, the European leaders, they don't really like Wilson all that much. Uh, they thought he was too idealistic. Uh, they thought he was kind of full of himself. Uh, Clemenceau, the leader of France, he joked that God had needed only 10 commandments, but Wilson had to have 14. Uh, and so there's this kind of sense that Wilson is, you know, sort of a little bit, you know, kind of too big for his britches here. And there's this all this kind of unease also about the unstable situation in Eastern Europe. There's this threat of communism from Russia. The Bolshevik government is unrepresented in Paris. And so there's this kind of looming threat over here from, uh, from the Bolsheviks. Now, Europe is divided at this point. Uh, the European people are fed up with war. They have been fighting for a lot longer than the Americans have. And they have, you know, as I mentioned, they've lost an entire generation of, you know, sort of young men in the war. Um, and they are driven as much by feelings of rage and revenge as by these kind of lofty ideals uh, that Wilson is bringing to the table. So a lot of these allied leaders, these European leaders, are determined to both punish Germany for the war and also enlarge their own empires. Wilson, on the other hand, he's trying to create this new international order uh, based on his 14 points. And he, he kind of these two, this idealism competes with this European national self-interest at the peace conference. Uh, so he's able to achieve some kind of limited acceptance of the idea of self-determination. Uh, at the conference, they carve out a number of new countries, uh, Austria, Hungary, Yugoslavia, uh, Latvia, Lithuania. Uh, they create Poland, they create Czechoslovakia, Finland, Estonia, uh, partly as an effort to try to help contain the threat of communism in Eastern Europe. They don't give these small nations very much power, though, at the negotiating table, and they leave the Soviets in Russia out entirely. Uh, but this idea of national self-determination is, you know, as I mentioned, it's great in theory, but what does it really mean? These European nations, they are not ready to allow self-determination for their colonies abroad. Uh, and Wilson himself really acknowledged that he hadn't really thought out this 
the implications of this idea of self-determination, he didn't realize how many people might actually claim it as their right and say, hey, you know, we want to determine our own destiny too. We don't want, you know, this the, the British to control us. We don't want the French to control us. Uh, and so this became a, you know, a pretty kind of problematic idea for, uh, for Wilson and for the European leaders. So Wilson ends up having to make some major concessions to get his idealistic vision. Uh, the... Allied delegates, they are able to exploit uh, his commitment to this idea of the League of Nations to extract concessions from him. Uh, and so he's, a, he's willing to make a lot of compromises in order to save this beloved plan for the League of Nations. So he's forced to kind of go along with making Germany pay these, you know, sort of huge reparations, basically saying, Germany, you are responsible for the war. Now you have to pay us, you know, for all the damages that you've caused. Uh, Germany has to admit that they're guilty. Uh, they lose a bunch of territory. Uh, they have to pay back all these reparations. Later, it was set at fifty-six billion dollars. Uh, and he, Wilson, also ends up accepting uh, this system that allows Britain and France to take over a bunch of colonies that Germany had had in the Middle East and in and, and in Asia. Uh, and you know, basically, he he, you know, he. This is not really the kind of peace without victory that he had been seeking. And so the sense of betrayal and the sense of, you know, kind of, uh, you know, resentment that German people end up feeling coming out of the Treaty of Versailles is going to have some significant later repercussions. Now, Wilson... He has gained the endorsement of this idea of the League of Nations, and he hopes this is an organization that is going to prevent future wars from breaking out. Uh, now, this League consists of a council of five great powers, uh, and then there would be dele delegates from smaller countries, and it would also have a world court to a to settle disputes. Now, not all members in this League would count equally. The council members, which were supposed to be the U.S., Britain, France, Italy, and Japan, they would be the leaders in the world organization. They would confer with each other. They would make recommendations to the larger body. So it's kind of like the UN Security Council is today. But unlike the UN, these council members would not have veto power. And the role of the council members was going to be more like moral leaders rather than military leaders. So they were supposed to kind of set this example of international cooperation to ensure security. Now, the key to the whole operation of the League of Nations was Article 10. And this was a pledge that all members were supposed to take to respect and preserve against external aggression the territorial integrity of other members. So basically what it said was if any member of this League of Nations is experiencing external aggression, if, if any other country is, uh, you know, kind of coming in and encroaching upon the territory of another, of a member of the League of Nations, then all the other members are supposed to come to their defense. Uh, and so this, you know, sought to provide the use of collective force if necessary. Uh, and so Wilson comes back, he presents, uh, he, he comes back from the Treaty of Versailles, and he presents his uh, treaty to the Senate. Of course, the Senate has to ratify it on July 10th, 1919. And he encounters a huge amount of opposition uh, when he presents this proposal. Many senators have objections. Uh, there are a bunch who, you know, are so-called irreconcilables. Uh, they are opposed to this whole idea in principle. Uh, they say that, you know, this is going to take away America's sovereignty. We are trying to denationalize America. We're trying to strip the nation of its manhood. It's, you know, very, like, again, you know, uh, you know, idealistic and, you um, very, you know, kind of uh, pro-nationalistic. Uh, other opponents are concerned because they, you know, they, they get, they oppose it because they may, mainly see it as kind of a winning issue for Republicans in 1920. Uh, most notably, the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, a guy named Henry Cabot Lodge. Lodge was an extreme opponent of Wilson, and he used every possible tactic that he could to obstruct and delay and amend this treaty. Now, the public is generally in favor of ratification. And gradually, what ends up happening in Congress is that they start to pass all these amendments to the League Agreement. 
limiting America's obligations to the League of Nations, uh, in particular to Article 10, saying, you know, sort of that uh, you have to come to the defense of another country. Uh, and Wilson, of course, refuses to compromise. He refuses to modify Article 10. Uh, he says this is the whole key uh, to the whole thing. And if you modify it, that takes away all of the power. So this cartoon here is a cartoon, an anti-league political cartoon that was uh, published in the Chicago Tribune. And it shows the United States there, uh, Uncle Sam, being wedded to so-called foreign entanglements uh, by the league. And they're only being saved by the U.S. Senate breaking in and interrupting the ceremony by brandishing constitutional rights. So you can see this is, you know, sort of uh, an argument uh, in, you know, against the, the, the League of Nations. Now, Wilson, he believes that he can ensure ratification of the Treaty of Paris, if, a Treaty of Versailles, if he takes his case directly to the American people. And so he starts off on this very grueling cross-country public relations speaking tour to get the public behind this idea of the League of Nations. And for more than three weeks, he travels over 8,000 miles by train. He speaks off as often as four times a day. He hardly gets any rest. He gives 37 speeches in 29 cities. And he's greeted very warmly by the public. Now, Wilson, he was 60 years old at the time. He was not in the best of health before the trip. And after he gives a speech in Pueblo, Colorado, on September 25th, 1919, he collapses with severe headaches. He cancels the rest of his tour. He rushes back to Washington. A few days later, he suffers a massive stroke. His entire left side is just paralyzed. His vision is impaired. And for the next year and a half, Wilson was basically incapable of running the government. Uh, his wife... Uh, Edith Wilson was essentially in charge, uh, and his doctors kind of shielded him from any official pressures, and they also prevented the public from really receiving any accurate information about how severe his condition really was. Now, this is before the rise of any kind of you know national mass media when something like this could be kept a secret. Uh, Wilson is irritable. He's depressed. He cannot help. He cannot lead the fight for his League of Nations. Uh, and his condition really kind of intensifies this strong tendency that he already had to see these issues in kind of moral terms and to reject any attempts at compromise. So he becomes even more kind of entrenched in his position of that this is how things need to be. He's essentially an invalid for the last 18 months of his presidency. Uh, when the Foreign Relations Committee finally sends the Versailles Treaty to the Senate, uh, there are nearly 50 different amendments and reservations and kind of changes made to it. Wilson refuses to consider any of these. And so finally, the treaty, you know, enrolling the United States in the League of Nations is finally killed in March of 1920. Uh, and... Uh, you know, basically, so we never end up actually joining uh, this organization that Wilson had so, you know, sort of fought for and believed in. Now, even during the Versailles Treaty Conference, the American public's attention was already starting to turn back to domestic issues. Uh, the war had caused an economic downturn. It had uh, ended sooner than anybody had anticipated. And the nation had not planned for any kind of conversion to a post-war economy. And so when the price controls that had been implemented during the war were suddenly abandoned, inflation went, you know, skyrocketing. Uh, throughout most of 1919 and 1920, prices rose uh, at an average of more than 15 percent. And by late 1920, that bubble finally burst and inflation began causing the market to, to turn downward. Uh, and so there was this huge kind of economic depression after, after the war. Now, this causes a series of, uh, you know, strikes and labor unrest. Laborers are worried about their job security. Uh, veterans are coming back from the war. They, of course, you know, the, 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 ar the arduous working conditions that they had been working under, you know, continue to be a source of discontent. Uh, and employers, you know, basically said they, you know, they used the end of the war to uh, rescind a lot of benefits that they had been offering workers at, uh, during the war. 
So in 1919, we see this unprecedented wave of strikes. Uh, there are more than 3,000 strikes involving 4 million workers. Uh, and, you know, sort of one of the largest strikes uh, was a steel strike uh, that began in September of 1919. 350,000 steel workers demanded an eight-hour day, a living wage. Uh, they demanded recognition of their union. This strike was very long. It was very bitter. Uh, and it culminated in a riot in Gary, Indiana, that resulted in the deaths of 18 strikers. Now, the owners of the steel mills were able to convince the public that these strikes were the result and the, you know, these strikes were caused by radicals and Bolsheviks uh, infiltrating the country. They put ads in the newspapers urging workers to, quote, stand by America, show up the red agitator. And because most people ended up buying this argument, most people ended up believing that the communists had inspired the strike, the issues, the actual issues that the workers were fighting for got lost and eventually the Union surrendered. Now, after the Russian Revolution in 1917, communism is no longer just a theory. It's now the basis of a regime. Uh, and people are very concerned that they're going to that the Soviets in Russia are going to try to export their revolution around the world. And this is exacerbated because in the spring of 1919, there's a series of bombings, uh, small sort of radical groups in America uh, were presumably responsible for this series of bombings in the spring of 1919. <laughs> The post office intercepts uh, a, a bunch of packages addressed to leading businessmen and politicians, uh, and uh, some of them ended up actually getting through and, and exploding. Uh, one of them even damaged the home of the Attorney General, A. Mitchell Palmer. And so in response to this, uh, there becomes known as what, what becomes known as the first Red Scare. Uh, you see the federal government basically orchestrating a series of raids. They become known as the Palmer Raids after Attorney General Palmer. Uh, they basically arrest a whole, but they break into all these kind of, you know, radical groups. They arrest more than 6,000 people. Uh, these raids, they thought that they would find these huge caches of weapons and explosives. They ended up getting only three pistols. So, you know, it's clear that this was, you know, sort of a massive overreaction to what was not really a, that big of a problem. Uh, most of those who were arrested were eventually released, uh, but 500 people were deported as a result of this. And so we see this, you know, kind of new efforts to try to get rid of so-called radicals uh, throughout the United States. This picture here is a picture of a labor union headquarters in New York City after being raided by the Justice Department as part of these Palmer raids. So after the war, we see this huge amount of disillusionment coming into play. Uh, we see kind of people looking at what had happened in World War I and really kind of becoming very disenchanted with the whole uh, system that they feel had, felt had brought it about, which you can see in this cartoon here. You have an editor, a capitalist, a politician, and a minister, and they are, you know, celebrating down there, and they're, you know, they're throwing up these signs which say, all for democracy, all for honor, all for world peace, all for Jesus. They're having their fling and they're making, you know, presumably making money, while in the background you have, you know, sort of this violent, you know, sort of conflict going on and, you know, they're profiting from it, basically. And that was the feeling of a lot of people. A lot of people came to feel that, you know, the war was futile and wasteful, that, you know, so many people had died and for what? Uh, nothing had really changed. Um, and we see kind of the progressive spirit in the post-war period, surviving to some extent, but didn't have the same kind of enthusiasm or broad-based support uh, that it had before the war. And Americans at the end of the war, they're really just, they, you know, had gone through this whole period of progressive reform. They, you know, sort of are, you know, culminating in this war that was supposed to make the world safe for democracy. 
Uh, but they are just tired of it all, and they welcome the new president coming in, President Warren G. Harding, and his call for a return to normalcy after the war. And so that's what we're going to examine uh, the next time. We're going to be looking at the 1920s and the coming of the Great Depression. Uh, so that will be for next week. And um, if you have any questions, uh, please do post them in the, in the general questions forum, or you can email me. And I hope you guys all have a good week.